We're traveling in the ancient kingdom of Magadha in northern India, in the plain of the Ganges. I've come here looking for the roots of today's vegetarian and vegan movements. As a long-time vegan, I want to know how we've got here. In this series, we'll discover how the ideas around vegetarianism have changed and spread up until the present. Those ideas emerge almost simultaneously in the middle of the first millennium BCE, both here in the Magadha Kingdom and in the Greek world. This series begins with three episodes centred on three pivotal teachers. We'll get to the third of them, Pythagoras, later. He is gathering followers to his meatless musical mathematical cult around the Mediterranean shores. The first two are leaders amongst the Shramanas, the vagabond monks travelling around Magadha and exchanging manifold philosophies. They renounce home, possessions and the old-time Vedic religion. The two men know about each other. They teach in the same town. Their orders will become major religions. And the man we know as the Buddha is only the second of them. Farming is spreading through the fertile river plain. Urban centres are developing, and with them, revolutionary ideas about our relationship with animals, especially in the Magadha capital. The shamanic movements, Jains, Buddhists and others now forgotten, are challenging the existing Vedic tradition of animal sacrifice and championing ahimsa, the avoidance of harm. One of those travelling shramanas, Mahavir, would stop and preach here, beneath the Kragi Rajjir hills, a spot his modern followers mark with a temple and hospital complex. Of Jainism, of Ahimsa, and of vegetarianism speaks Mahavir. Sattva Yasaje Maharaj is a Shramana too. A Jain nun she'd been reading in her low circular white prayer hall when I was introduced. She'd come outside to sit and, with some help from an English speaking staff member, talk. This area here was a great park. People used to come and stay for the four month rainy season to use those four months for the spiritual life. Among the trees and birds, it's still possible to imagine the people of Magadha sheltering from rain and listening to Mahavir. This episode, I'll ask experts and followers about his ideas, where they might have come from, and what they inspired. Vegetarianism, the story so far, with me, Ian MacDonald. Episode 1, Ahimsa. I want to start at the very beginning. Archaeology suggests humans first gathered, then also scavenged, then also hunted for at least two million years before the philosophers of India and Greece. If we look at the way a cat kills a mouse, they evidently don't show any anxiety or ambivalence about it. It's just something they do. But humans appear to be different. James Serpel thinks animal ethics begin to stir deep in prehistory. Um, I'm Professor of Animal Welfare at the University of Pennsylvania in uh, Philadelphia. What are the hunter-gatherer cultures that have survived in the present day show us about ancient attitudes towards other animals? The way they view it is very much analogous to the way they view killing another human being. A morally hazardous thing to do with repercussions. Could you give me a, a typical example of hunter-gatherer guilt? Some of the Inuit tribes, you know, they are actively apologising to whatever they kill and expressing all kinds of thanks and gratitude to the animal and how they would never have done it if it wasn't an absolute necessity that they were starving and children were starving and they had to do this. Among the Amazon Indians it's the same. If you look at the Kung San in Bushmen in South Africa, it's the same. If you look at the Aborigines, it's the same. What could be more expressive, as it were, of 
that level of guilt, that level of anxiety and ambivalence than to have the hunter emptying his heart out to the, the slain animal and apologizing and making all these explanations for why the thing had to be done. Some anthropologists are sceptical about whether these surviving hunter-gatherers can speak for the cultures who settled into farming. But they remain our only clue. We have the spread of agriculture. How does that change our relationship? Well, it changes it very dramatically. The humans are placed in this position of responsibility over the animals. It made the whole thing become hierarchical. You see religions after that period become hierarchical. So the gods are above men, men are above the animals, and the animals are above the plants, and you get this hierarchical worldview. They performed many sacrifices. Thousands of animals were burned alive. That Vedic religion is already a millennium old when Mahavir preaches. But modern Hindus still share its priestly caste, the Brahmins, and its most sacred verses, the Vedas. Those yagnas show us how the Vedic culture saw animals, but they're very controversial in modern India. Let me tell you about one cold Saturday in Delhi when I met two professors who had quite different views. When historian Devendra Narayan Jha wrote in his book Myth of the Holy Cow that Vedic religion slaughtered cows in sacrifices, it was burnt by some Hindu nationalists who not just venerate cows, but believe India was always thus, and consider claims to the contrary blasphemous. His flat is in suburban Delhi, a short auto rickshaw ride from the metro station. The crowds and stalls give way to tree-lined roads, blocks of flats, and the noise of neighborhood life. We talked in his study. In the Vedic text, there's a lot of uh, discussion about killing of animals particularly in the context of the rituals. And there is uh, one particular sacrifice, uh, the horse sacrifice, in that about 600 and odd animals were killed. The oldest of those oral texts, the Rig Veda, has a hymn for that sacrifice. Secular historians translate its Sanskrit as... Those who examine the horse when ready and say, it smells good, remove it. And those who draw close, craving a share of the flesh of the steed, let their applause cheer us on. I took the Delhi Metro North until the elevated Line 2 peters out into giant pillars and construction crews. Then a crowded bus along the Great Trunk Road, which dropped me by some red brick Jain temples and an Indology Institute. In fact, nobody is Jaina in our Jaina Institute, except one. I talked with G.C. Tripathi by one of the smaller temples. Jain scholars suggested him, and he's a source for D.N. Jal's book, but he doesn't agree with it. I work on Vedas. You work on the Vedas. Uh, even in uh, the Rig Veda, we don't find any mention of animal sacrifice. The animal sacrifice in India, they make their appearance during the later Vedic period. That's the 8th and 9th centuries BCE, still well before Mahavir. But I asked him about older verses, like the one you just heard, that Dien Jha says show Brahmins sacrificing animals much earlier. They don't understand, he doesn't know Sanskrit, how can he, he write anything authoritative on it? Well, that's why I'd like to ask you, because... I know all my texts almost by heart. Because you're a Brahmin and you're I'm, part I of I know the, Sanskrit, I mean, Sanskrit has been in my family for the last, I don't know how many hundred years. I started my studies with Sanskrit, with five years or six years old. Tripathi is part of a living tradition that's as old as the Rig Veda itself. Magadha doesn't yet have writing. Only the Brahmins offer the actual words of ancestors. Oxford University Indologist Richard Gombridge. If you were the son of a Brahmin, you had to go through very, a whole series of very particular rituals, and you were supposed to spend 
your first few years, sometimes not even very few, sometimes until you were well into adulthood, memorizing the Brahmin texts. First that came the texts, and after that, understanding what they meant. I met other Sanskrit scholars who completely rejected suggestions of Vedic sacrifice. Secular and religious historians often disagree, and I wanted to let you see this one up close. But I found no convincing alternative to the interpretations of historians like D. N. Jar. They believe the ancient Brahmins sacrificed animals, if not burning alive, and that their verses recall a distant past of nomadic herding before slow centuries of spreading eastwards down the Ganges. We'll catch up with this controversy when the story reaches modern India. So what do these rituals say about how Vedic religion sees other animals? James Serple. When you get to these more hierarchical agricultural and pastoral systems, they've looked after these animals from birth, and uh, yet at the end of the day, they're going to betray that trust. They're going to kill those animals. In the Rig Veda, the hymn of the horse sacrifice ends. Truly, Truly here, here thou diest not, thou, thou art not harmed. By easy paths unto the gods thou goes. James Serple finds this sentiment typical. We look at how people deal with animal death and time and time again we see all these interesting explanations for why something which is actually bad is not in fact bad. It represents something else or it's symbolic or it's because we're sending the spirit of the animal to its homeland, all this stuff. Some 20th century scholars speculated that the idea of actual nonviolence developed out of that ritual denial of harm, perhaps in stages via the purifying temporary vegetarianism of a Brahmin priest before a sacrifice. We'll never know how much the Brahmins and Shramanas borrowed ideas from each other. But we do know that by the time of Mahavir, some Brahmins are passing down philosophical works called Upanishads, that respect their rituals, but also include some ideas they share with the Shramanas. The people who are there who renounced the world, they lived uh, on the fruits of the forests, or they begged their food in the city. In Upanishads, there is emphasis on ascetic life, and therefore there is also emphasis on non-killing of animals, and this ties up with more or less contemporary Buddhist movement and Zen movement. So this is a Sanskrit text, it's part of the Brahminic tradition. And the idea of Ahimsa, the seeds of vegetarianism, are already there. Yes, it, it, it's already there. What exactly is this word that English renders Ahimsa? Richard Gombridge. Uh, ahimsa is grammatically from han, to kill or sometimes just to strike. But hingsa means desire or wish to kill. And a is the negative. So ahingsa means lack of wish to kill. Ultimately, it is a psychological term. And the literal meaning of shramana reminds us what unites these itinerant begging mendicants. Yesaje. Shaman means one who meditates, works hard, labors. His aims and goals he achieves with his own hard work. The Shramanas believe you can achieve enlightenment or whatever the goal is through your own efforts. You can only be born a Brahmin, but anybody who has left the household life and decided not to take part either in production or reproduction, there is a Shramana. I'm Peter Flügel, Chair of Jaina Studies at SOAS. School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. I mean, with the Upanishads and uh, all these other ascetics, there's a big distinction between forest ascetics and these mendicant orders, the Shramanas. Forest monks, they live there with their families, the Jain and Buddhist monks and nuns, they had to beg for their food. That means they live in the midst of the urban population. They reflect a completely new society. In the kingdom of Magadha, Mahavir addresses a crowd that have probably heard many other shamanic groups, creeds now long forgotten. 
We do know that the Shramanas are arguing over not just Ahimsa, but concepts like fate, karma, rebirth and liberation. Rajgir is the capital of a kingdom, the heart of a region that is an incubator of religious movements. In those days, there were half a dozen so-called learned people. Buddha, Ajit Kesh Kambal, Prabhudika, Ten Goshalak and Mahavir. But when it came to understanding the truth, most of them didn't do very well. There were half a dozen of them, but their theories were not sound. Except Buddha, who was very close to Mahavir, with only slight philosophical differences. The earliest one of which we know a huge amount with good early evidence is Buddhism. But there is very, very good reason to believe that Jainism is somewhat older than Buddhism. The first thing is that Jainism is a pre-Vedic and a prehistoric religion. Dr. Priya Darshna Jain leads the Department of Jainology in the University of Madras. It's a Victorian university by the Bay of Bengal. The theology departments are in a building stored around a courtyard to let the sea air circulate. I came to her room next to the departmental office milling with her students to ask questions about what Jains believe. Uh, Lord Mahavira was not the founder of Jainism. He was only the 24th teacher of Jainism. The Jains themselves would say it's thousands of years older than Buddhism. We needn't accept that because there's no good evidence at all. But certainly it's a few generations older than Buddhism. The person who might be historical is the one before Mahavira, Parshwa. How radical was vegetarianism at the time? Vegetarianism was very small. Most people weren't vegetarian. Outside of Magadh, Bihar state, there were more non-vegetarians. Parshwa's impact was here. What set Mahavir's message mm -hmm. apart? What was specific to him? What would we hear if we were sheltering here in the rainy season? Some used to say there is no God. And some used to say he is in the ocean or in the mountain or there is only one supreme soul. Mahavir said, that every soul can be supreme. Every soul can reach the pinnacle of purity. His preaching of non-violence is based solely on this. In every living being he saw the same spirit that he had. He saw the greatness in every ordinary being. Peter Flugel. Mahavira as a historical person is difficult to figure out because the texts are late and obviously constructions made for a particular purpose. For example, texts put Mahavir in the 6th century BCE, historians more often the 5th. According to them, Mahavira was the son of a king or tribal leader who realized the fertility of worldly existence, left his family and wandered about as a mendicant from the Akranga text. In these places was the wise Shamana for 13 long years. He meditated day and night, exerting himself undisturbed, strenuously. He didn't join a mendicant group, but he self-initiated by removing his hair and changing his dress. And after a few years, he walked naked because the rag he wore was falling off and he didn't replace it. They say he injured scorn. He was struck with a stick, the fist, a lance, hit with a fruit, a clod, a pot shard. When he once sat without moving his body, they cut his flesh, tore his hair under pains or covered him with dust. Abandoning the care of his body, the venerable one, humbled himself and bore pain, free from desire. Until he reached enlightenment and from that point onward he began to teach what he has learned, i.e. that there's a path for the liberation of the soul from the fetters of the karmically produced body. First speech, speech uh, thousands of people mm. 
they uh, renunciation they just renounce the world and renouncing the world means becoming a, a monk or not yeah. they join mahavira's monastic order in the hope of also becoming a liberated conqueror of their desires he leaves the road to birth and death rejoicing in the glorious liberation over on the other side of the persian empire there are greeks too who are vegetarian because they believe in reincarnation we'll meet them later Richard Gombridge told me how the idea of rebirth emerges in Vedic religion, not initially as something that happens for everyone. According to the last book of the Rig Veda, there is a cycle of rebirth for human males. It isn't really properly ethicized at all. It doesn't say if he was a good, honest man, this happens, and if he, if he was a thief, that happens. No. Whereas in Buddhism and Jainism, you can go up or you can go down, etc., according to your ethics in life. And the mechanism for that is karma. The, the, the combination of reincarnation and karma, that is uh, specifically Indian. And the Jains are, of course, the masters of the karma theory. The Jains have a really specific visual concept of karma. Yes, karma is perceived as a form of matter which sticks to your body and becomes the seed for a new action of the same quality. So if one doesn't act violently, one can step by step withdraw from this predicament and ultimately, after many, many rebirths, uh, leave this terrible uh, cycle of re-death. Jainism is a, a non-violent way of living and it doesn't believe in a creator god and it rejects the authority of the Vedas. Mahavir preached vegetarianism. Mahavira preached non-violence. We don't have the word vegetarian in any Jain scripture. We have ahimsa. We have live and let live. We have mutual interdependence. Parasparo upagraho jivanam. The word vegetarian is a 19th century invention. We'll encounter many different ideas around the ethic of not eating animals, not all of which translate perfectly to the modern concept of a complete and permanent principled abstention from eating flesh. The roots of vegetarianism singular lie in many different vegetarianisms plural. Those early Jain texts are indeed overwhelmingly strongly, for want of a better word, vegetarian. A couple of ostensible exceptions in special cases suggest to historians like D.N. Jar that progress towards strict vegetarianism might still have been going on at the time of Mahavir. Peter Flugel. In the texts, there is mention of Mahavira eating meat that was prepared for him of a dead cock, a, a roadkill, as it were, for him to regain his health. The Vyakya Prinapti seems to say, he asked, To send the cock killed by the cat, instead of the two pigeons she was preparing for him. He doesn't kill it. And according to Buddhism, indeed, he's absolutely innocent. But the Jains don't like that. And therefore, they say that this word, which clearly refers to a chicken, actually refers to a kind of plant. Uh, a word may have many, many meanings, many, many interpretations. Okay, so this interpretation is done by the rival religions who want to defame Jainism. So Mahavira never, never, never ate any kind of meat. So it's not chicken. It is not chicken. It is uh, it's uh, something related with a crow or an anim a bird. So one medieval translation goes to send the citron pulp seasoned with viralika herb instead of the two gourds. This is what medieval Jains onwards tend to say denying the literal meaning. Well, we, um, we don't know the literal meaning. I mean, these are dead languages. We should not forget this. And no one knows exactly what these words meant when they were written down. And it doesn't seem to make any sense within the context of Jain uh, teachings uh, to have Mahavira of all people eating meat or, or permitting meat to be prepared for him. Basically, I'm with the Jains on this point. This from the Akaranga is characteristic. The enlightened and worshipped of the past, present and future speak thus, declare thus, proclaim thus. All breathing, existing, living, sentient creatures should not be slain, 
nor treated with violence, nor abused, nor tormented, nor driven away. We're glimpsing the emergence of Jainism through the fog of centuries of oral transmission. For Jains, enlightened teachers have been revealing eternal truth since prehistory, and these few lines are deeply controversial. But this series is about people making the case generation by generation. So what is Jain vegetarianism? Jains apply himsa to a world they see as alive with beings to be protected from suffering. If you take a stone and regard a stone as a living being, this is not unusual. In many tribes across the planet, you find animist beliefs. So if you behave very badly, you can be reincarnated as a rock? Uh, definitely. A stone, like any living being, from a Jain perspective, is composed of a soul and a body. And a stone is just another type of body. Jains rank beings by how many senses they have. The meat, the animals, the fish and the eggs are all products of the five sensed beings. Whereas the plants and vegetables are all one sensed. And insects are in between with two or three senses. Taking it through to a logical conclusion, early Jains look at plants with more potential for life, like root vegetables that can sprout indefinitely, conclude they must contain infinite lives, and so... I mean, prepare a food that is without the underground roots and stems. And Although not all modern Jains have a literal belief in one-sensed beings of earth, wind, fire and water, the intention to tread lightly upon the earth remains. So the minimum you take from the environment, the less will be your karmic load. And the more you exploit and take from the environment, the greater will be the karmic load as well as the carbon imprint that we live in the environment. Consider the challenge of Ahimsa if you contemplate a world alive with invisible single-sensed beings. So the practical consequence is that ultimately you should not act at all. And that makes life rather uh, complicated to say the least. The logical conclusion for Jains, the lightest way to tread, can be to stop treading. It is clear in the Jain scriptures that if you want to reach liberation at the last moment of your last existence, you should, should stop acting at all. Nobody wants to die, but death is inevitable. And when you die, you should die like a hero, not being f fearful or being desirous and this kind of holy death can enable you to terminate your cycle of rebirths. Yes, by simply refusing food until you waste away. Yeah, it is not just simply refusing food. Refusing food and doing what? Mm -hmm. To be absorbed spiritually. This practice is rare but not unknown today, when Jains face death. Mahavir's sermons didn't just affect the monks and nuns who abandoned their homes for him. They spread their doctrines amongst lay people like Priyadarshana. At the very beginning, there must have been just a small group of mendicants who were interacting with householders. The monks and nuns depend on the lay men and women for their basic needs like food, water and clothing. A Jain community, i.e. a group of lay followers, developed and, uh, only slowly. So it is not just that the ascetics uh, who are uh, following vegetarianism, it is the lay men and women also who follow vegetarianism. Yeah, but, but it is not merely an ethical obligation. It is yeah. a, a religious discipline and a spiritual discipline in itself. Jains will spread far beyond the Kingdom of Magadha and have an influence beyond their numbers that means we'll come back to them again and again. One of those craggy Rajjir hills, called Vulture's Peak, is a place of pilgrimage for followers of our second Shramana. Mahavir came before Buddha. He was older than Buddha. Mahavir attained enlightenment before Buddha. After Mahavir, Buddha lived on after Mahavir's Nirvana. Buddhists even have the story of how, after his death, news was given immediately to the Buddha. Next episode, we turn to the philosophy that will carry the idea of a fleshless diet throughout Asia to Prince Gautama, to Buddhism. With the voices of Sandeep Gaucha, Chetan Patak, and Selva Rasalingam, the music of Rob Masters. 
I'd like to thank Smita Bagricha for interpreting and Shatan Suchayagi and Rajan Joshi for translation. Full credits and more information at theveganoption.org.